much she traveled. And knowing women who made a difference. A cooler kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview with Marion Ramuel, conducted on April 28, 2006, by Megan. How did you contribute to lacrosse about like family planning? What did you exactly do? Well, what a <coughs> I was in on the beginnings of the lacrosse family planning clinic, yeah. and uh, it was up a very long stairway on an old building on Fourth and uh, near State Street, and. Uh, a lot of people worked on this. I was just one one of them, and uh, uh, it was furnished with furniture from people's attic because there was no money. But this this was started because the nation, back in Washington, decided that they wanted family planning to be available to all over the country. Yeah and they were going to provide money and it would come through the states and the states were to see that everybody had access to this health service and so there was a group of people in La Crosse that got going and organized and found this place a few a collection of rooms in this old building and we set up what was called the La Crosse Family Planning Center and we were helped uh, professionally by a nurse practitioner who worked for the Community Action Program. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether you know or will have in your interview groups the Community Action Program, but it still exists. Mm -hmm. And it was a wonderful effort to help uh, rural people in all kinds of, of, of uh, situations of poverty having to do with health, housing and all yeah. kinds of other problems. But uh, they, their nurse practitioner became our professional person. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she helped and I just worked in the, in the office. Mm -hmm. And after a year <coughs> of doing that, I became the, the director and I was a director for a couple of years more years <laughs> and so that's what my connection was I was not a professional nurse or uh, I so did not you helped start the family planning center in La Crosse yes and then it expanded in two years while I was a director we were asked by the state to expand to five counties not just La Crosse but all five of the surrounding counties and it became the Cooley region family and it's now a very professional uh, group called Options. Did you help like in other communities? Uh, not really. I, I was the president of the board. Of the board? And uh, uh, we had, um, as we expanded, we, we had hired people. We were all volunteers <coughs> to begin with. It was all volunteer except for the nurse practitioner from the Community Action Program. And uh, otherwise it's all volunteer. Mm -hmm. And, but we got our money and, and, uh, from the state and we were to serve low income women. They were mostly what we call working poor people uh, because if you were below a certain poverty line, you could get care um, through Medicaid, but if you were just above that but did not have a very much money, if women wanted to control the number of babies they had or uh, when, you know, when they had children, uh, uh, they had to pay to do that. The other problem was at that time there were many women whose religion did not allow them to use contraceptions and they were discouraged mm -hmm. to and some of them found themselves with very little money but more and more babies than they had planned to have or wanted to have and even their doctor 
Christians, if they were of the same religion, uh, would not uh, provide them with prescriptions. And um, so we, to begin with, we served mostly married women who were very low income, but not below this certain level for Medicaid, and or women who were served like their doctors for other reasons, but they would not uh, get the contraceptive care, family planning care, so that they could time their babies or not have any more if they already had a big family and, and did not have enough money that they could take care of. And sometimes they had to take, uh, you know, choices for their mm -hmm. new foods for their kids or, uh, or health care for Cells. And we did not provide the direct professional care until uh, a few years later. We sent them to their doctors, and we, I think, helped encourage the medical profession. You know, this whole business of care, of, of, of reproductive care for women was a very touchy subject. It's hard now because there's so much openness about yeah. sexuality and about reproductive life, but it was a very touchy subject and doctors did not um, discuss it, even though a, a lot of doctors by that time, 1970, we're talking 1970 to 1972 and on, um, there were a lot of doctors that would get, provide, but in certain certain doctors would not. So mm -hmm. we were serving married women who wanted to control their reproductive life and uh, they came to us and we would call their doctors and we called them. We had doctors who helped persuade <laughs> the other doctors that if they wanted to have referrals from us, we sent everybody to their, doc their own doctors to get care if they wanted to have referrals to us um, and have us pay for it, mm -hmm. um, they uh, needed to provide this care. And so that encouraged women and it helped change the medical um, yeah. medical services for these women. So you started off just helping married women? And well, not, ju not just married women, but I would say that over 50% yeah. of our women with. I have a question for yes. you. Um, yes. At all during your career, did you have any stories that are like um, you yeah. won't forget ever, and you really explain like like um, how what you did and everything? Some some kind of story that you might want to share that you've never forgotten. Uh, I had various uh, conversations with um, people who objected to what we were doing in terms of offering this service, and there were efforts to close us down. We did not provide abortions, but they included their negative attitude toward what we were doing also. And uh, we got a certain amount of hate mail, and they still, uh, with options, still had people um, protesting in front mm -hmm. of the building. One of the things we did, we, we, we talked, I said we had over 50% married. That's not even true now because I would say the majority of, of the of women are uh, not necessarily married. They're mostly between the ages of say 19 and 25, something like that because the sexual attitudes have changed and we had even then young girls, quite young, come in and they were already sexually active, but we were probably the first adults that they had ever talked to because they did not talk to their parents. Their parents weren't very comfortable about mm -hmm. talking about sex. Mm -hmm. And the one thing we knew, even if we might not think it was good for them to be having sex at a very young age, one thing we didn't want them to do was have a baby mm -hmm. because it could really begin a terrible life for mm -hmm. them. And 
so we would help them the best we could. But we would also get them to look at what they were doing and say, is this a good thing, a yeah. way to be uh, doing because of the troubles that could get into. And, um, but one little thing, as I remember, is that I got a phone call from a, uh, one of the church people and, um, and a counselor within our uh, church organization. And the, we were on kind of a conference call. And they wanted us to report to them about what young girls, who the young girls were, were who came to see us. And one of our prime rules was we would never reveal mm -hmm. that our services were totally confidential. Mm -hmm because if these young people uh, felt we were reporting to anybody about them, they would never come see us again. And then they would be in danger again, either with sexual diseases or unwanted pregnancies. And our main goal was, I, I had to print uh, our logo, every child I wanted, to, uh, and that was our, our goal. Uh, and we didn't want to lecture the people that on their lives, but we wanted these babies to be born mm -hmm. in a, to a wanted situation. Have your family members been okay with you doing this, um, Dan Kearney? Yes, they've been very encouraging. My husband's a doctor, and he was very much in favor of this. children grew up in a different environment and they were, were uh, willing to yeah. have any of them ever become what you are like uh, we have a daughter who's a midwife mm -hmm. so she's busy taking care of all kinds of uh, women in different states yeah. some some of them with babies that maybe they shouldn't have had, <laughs> but they've got them, and, uh, she, but she's in the delivery business. But in dealing with these women, she's also helping with counseling with them, too, because but she's delivered many, many babies. She's still doing that. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, and one of our daughters, for while worked for Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. which is an organization. She worked up in St. Paul, but uh, so she was involved in the same uh, kind of work, except hers was yeah. a paid, paid job. And at all during your career, did anybody inspire you to do this, or was it just to help people out? Well, I, I have to say that I, I got interested um, really a, a little earlier because I belong to some of these study groups I talked about with Mrs. Gunderson. And I really uh, got very disturbed with what I thought was uh, overpopulation in various parts of the world, particularly poor countries. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and there isn't any problem in this world that is not made worse by overpopulation our resources and that's and you people are going to watch this develop even more because water water is disappearing <laughs> yeah. uh, as the populations grow and you have these uh, pop, uh, rate of uh, birth in, in poor countries that it's higher partly because it was rural and people wanted a lot of children but they also lost there was a lot of death uh, early death of children, and, but they had these huge families, and as you watch the news now, every so often you'll see an Afghan woman with yep. eight children, and, uh, and not much money, or being in a war zone, <laughs> or something yeah. really awful. So I was really quite concerned about uh, about uh, the lack of, of concern, and in this country, I have to say right now, population, overpopulation is almost not talked about at all. And
And even though you watch our good farmland be taken over by developers, and you watch us begin to get in trouble, I mean, it'll happen in this country. We're a very rich country, so we're not suffering in the way that you read about in foreign countries. Mm -hmm. But that was really my beginning of just uh, families having more babies than my, uh, I, within my family history. My grandmother, one of my grandmothers was a second wife. But you know, one of the reasons for all the stepmother stories in, in uh, uh, the grim fairy tales and all those, those stepmothers was because women were killed. I mean, they died with having born too many children. Mm -hmm. And um, and that happened, and it's the reason my grandfather's first wife died, that she had ten children and she was sick at the end and shouldn't have been having mm -hmm. children. So it was a com it was a common, mm -hmm. uh, common story. Would you say that um, you helped a lot of the people that came to you? I was just part of a group. There were so many people, and the, and what happened to get the country even to want to pay to help women um, took a long evolution. Yeah, <laughs> it took more influence from all kinds of women. And I, as far as my work in this organization, um, I was just, I wasn't even the idea person. I, I worked with some wonderful people. I just hung in there and I was kind of a good foot soldier for many years. Uh, I didn't work outside the home um, and uh, so I had flexible time. And I did work in a lot of organizations, but I learned that from my mother, who was also, who also did similar kinds of uh, work, and so I had a model in my own home, <laughs> of, uh, but she worked on different kinds of issues, but uh, I, I was a part of a team, I always would say that, that yes. I was not uh, a grand leader, and even the grand leaders built on top of work done by previous people. Mm -hmm. you know, they owe a lot. Um, at all in your success, did you have any like bumps in the road or like something that kind of made you think about what you were doing or anything? I was worried for a while because there was an organization set up by the state called the West Virginia Wisconsin Health agency, I forget what they called it, but they were trying to avoid, <coughs> avoid the expense of duplication in mm -hmm. health care. But also on this committee, this commission, were people that did not believe in, in family planning. Mm -hmm. And they, and they were just a few people on this commission, but they kept harassing our little organization and I had to go before them. And I have to say that was very unpleasant mm -hmm. because uh, it produced some hate mail mm -hmm. and it, uh, they just, they could not accept the fact that things had changed and people mm -hmm. and women wanted the rights to control um, their bodies. And you know, there was a book, if you've seen it, the old our bodies ourselves a lot. It was put out by a group of women in Boston and it made a great difference to, um, to women to begin to look at their rights in <coughs> terms of, uh, of uh, because the whole business of uh, unwanted children uh, was going to affect their lives forever. At all, did any of these people that threatened to put down your building or threatened to stop you, did they do anything that like made you like um, recuperate, or did they do anything no. worse than that? No, no, there, no, we had nothing like that. Okay, we just had kind of official 
meetings mm -hmm. and in which they uh, had we had to keep presenting or they would go to our offices and keep repeating our uh, demanding to see our educational material because we worked in the schools when we were invited to provide as much education and that's why sex education courses have evolved in the schools mm -hmm. but they've been there's been struggles about that because there are some parents who you know, don't want it or some legislators mm -hmm. don't and the fight seems I thought it would all be kind of passed but it, it isn't mm -hmm. some of those fights have to be to preserve it simply would help um, but it's not played out on that level it's uh, it gets involved in what they call their values, their religious point of mm -hmm. view. And um, that's too bad because it puts mm -hmm. women in a difficult position like that. So At all during your um, mm -hmm. career, did you do any extra volunteer work besides this, or did you do anything extra to help out with the community or anything? I worked with a lot of organizations. One was uh, we had a mayor that we thought was dreadful <laughs> and he was a mayor for 10 years and he was so involved with the people that wanted taxes to be low and who were not supporters of public schools and I mean those were his main political supporters and he was a, a newsman he had a, a every day he, his name was Milo Knudsen and within 10 years, he almost brought our public schools down to rock bottom. We had trouble hiring mm -hmm. good superintendents uh, because we got a reputation for being a bad school. We didn't keep up the, the, uh, uh, the, we didn't, uh, the schools were controlled by the city council. Mm -hmm. They appointed the school board. And they uh, managed the budget. Mm -hmm. And so our schools did not get repaired. And we just really had, and the teachers were miserable mm -hmm. <laughs> because it was just such an unpleasant time. Mm -hmm. And um, I was part of an organization we called Citizens Education Committee. Mm -hmm. And we decided something had to be done. And we in got involved with the League of Women Voters mm -hmm. and the American Association of University Women, mm -hmm. which I belong to, both of them. Mm -hmm. And we got as many other people as we could. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, well, we tried to defeat this mayor, which we never did. But we did uh, begin to uh, petition to have an elected school board. And that eventually happened, mm -hmm. but that uh, but that took a lot of, yeah. of work, and um, so I worked hard on that, for particularly in the '70s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my children, I have to say, they got tired of that <laughs> because <laughs> I went to so many meetings, all the meetings in the city that had anything to do with the schools, which included plan commissions and city board, uh, uh, city council meetings and and the school board meetings and it makes me not want to go to any meetings. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did with, with uh, a couple of friends. We were known as, I'm, th I'm sure, three terrorists. Uh -huh. but, we, uh, but just as I said about Carol Gunderson when there was her lessons, uh, because we did that, we really knew what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And then we talked to organiz other organizations and yeah. to get them on the way. Eventually, we got uh, the school board became elected. It doesn't mean you always elect the people you want, but it, it uh, gives you a chance to change the school board and they would not be just the political friends of yeah. the com city council. Mm -hmm.
children's home board for a little while and mm -hmm. that became family and children's center it, it stopped being a home for children uh, needed a place to live mm -hmm. and became a kind of a therapy for children that were at homes that made them homes needed help and the children needed help and it became something One thing I, my husband once said to me was, why don't you wait till your children are older before you yeah. um, uh, get on these committees and, and get involved? And um, I didn't quite know it at the time, but I know it now, that you need to do things when you have the energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. did a lot of interesting things and they studied things very seriously. We were a lot of, of women uh, not working outside the home. Now the league operates in a very different way and they're mostly professional and they do things so much better than we did in terms of, you know, they know how to use computers and yeah. they know how to uh, accomplish things in a shorter time, but they can't study in the same way. Who was here yeah. um, was one of the best uh, chair people of, of committees. We uh, put out books about the county, the organization of the city county, of the city of La Crosse, um, all kinds of reports like that. Um, are you still involved with a lot of different organizations? I belong to those three that I mentioned. In the AUW, I belong to study groups just because I enjoy study yeah, groups. Yeah. You know, I enjoy learning things. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not, um, and, um, but I, I don't, um, I'm not on boards yeah. anymore. Mm -hmm. and, I, uh, uh, and I don't go to all the school. I used, when I was younger and going to all these school board meetings, so mad that older people weren't coming. Well, now that I'm an older yeah. person, <laughs> I don't want to go out at night <laughs> to all those things. So I've learned a lot <laughs> about what happens to you when you yeah. get old and, and get tired, and at the end of the day, you're yeah. not worth much. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, I've been very active in, in community things, but I also I'm still a swimmer, but I can't play tennis anymore. And, you know, I, I did fun things. It wasn't that I was, it was uh, Do you have any more goals for later on to accomplish anything more? What I'm trying to do now, we live in a big old house and I grew up in it. Mm -hmm. So we have a big attic and it's full of stuff. It's kind of three generation mm -hmm. attic. And um, I, I just wrote about my thoughts and memories about my mother. Mm -hmm. And I have three sisters. We're all 80s, and I have a sister who's 90. And I just wrote a 
my piece about my, my, my thoughts about my mother. And then I gave my copies to my sisters, and mm -hmm. then that kind of stirs them to remember things about my wow. mother who's been gone a long time. That's sweet. And if I have a goal, whether I accomplish this or not, but I, we had a, my, my mother grew up in a big family, and the youngest of her sisters was a kind of a uh, exotic <laughs> woman, and I, ended up seeing quite a bit of her in her late in her 90s. And uh, she was both exotic and eccentric. And I had quite a lot of, I had some of her diaries mm -hmm. and letters. And I would like to write up some things about her. Yeah, and whether I can it. get it done or not, I don't know. I had, I found in the attic and copy books. I don't know whether you know what copy books were, but it's what the kids had in school. They were kind of brown cardboard and they weren't loose leaf. They were lined paper though. And yeah, I found I in a books. couple of copy books in the attic notes that my mother had written about a woman that we all knew. Um, she was a baby in Peshtigo, which burned the same day that the city of Chicago oh. burned in 1887. And her father rescued her as an eight-day-old eight baby. They all, the only ones that survived were in the river. And Annie Iverson was in the river as an eight-day-old baby. Yeah, and then they amazing. moved to La Crosse. And so she was an early uh, settler Please this podcast brought to you from across Wisconsin by the Cooley Kids at Longfellow Middle School in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.